We're back with another episode of our Six Questions podcast. I'm Trent England for Save Our States. Very glad to welcome uh, Josh Hammer back to the program. He is the uh, opinion editor at Newsweek and uh, just an outstanding journalist uh, writing about national issues and uh, international issues. Josh, welcome back to Six Questions. Trent, a longtime fan of yours and the organization, of course, so great to be back with you. Yeah. Well, thanks so much. Let's jump right into it. Uh, The first question is about COVID, which I, you know, I I don't know. I I wish we didn't have to talk about COVID anymore, but, uh, but we do. And the, you know, we've got the federal agencies basically admitting that the lab leak from Wuhan is the most likely origin of COVID. This was suppressed by the media why did that happen and why has it taken so long for, for all this to come out? I mean, how many times do we have to see the same narrative play over and over and over again, where a cluster of elites with kind of typically having fancy educational or academic credentials tend to gang up to suppress a story and dismiss it as disinformation? And or, you know, as the case may be in the Russia collusion hoax, Russian Russian disinformation, as the case may be with the Hunter Biden laptop in the New York Post saga, also Russian disinformation. So it's hard not for me in, in my mind to to directly relate the, the Hunter Biden laptop story to the covid lab leak story. In my mind, they are two sides of the, of the exact same coin here. And we know very clearly in the case of the Hunter Biden laptop, what the agenda was. The agenda was to reelect President Joe Biden and to dismiss damaging information on the president's son and to try to kind of hide information when it comes to Burisma and but Joe Biden in Ukraine and China and all the all that. I, I, the, the motive for suppressing the lab leak story is a little less obvious. I, I, I mean, I, I guess you have to kind of wonder what exactly they were trying to hide. And, you know, as Senator Rand Paul of Kentucky, to his great credit, has tried to do back when Anthony Fauci was was still in the government, virtually every time those two sparred off in the U.S. Senate, Rand Paul would try to figure out what was the U.S. taxpayer and the NIH doing at the Wuhan Institute of Virology when it comes to gain of function research, things like that. So, you know, I, I guess Occam's razor, I mean, the most straightforward guess is that we didn't or when I say we, I mean, like the U.S. government uh, elites did not want people to start probing about the extent to which the U.S. was involved in this Wuhan Institute of Virology, which effectively shut down the world for a year and a half, two years, two and a half years. I mean, depending on, on where you are in the world, obviously. But it's just a guess. I mean, like I said, it's not as obvious to me as to why the Hunter Biden laptop story, they want to deep six that one. But I, I, I would guess the U.S. government has probably been involved in some shady stuff there in Wuhan. And, and we know for certain that they have been involved in some shady stuff, actually. Yeah. And it's I mean, it makes sense on the the Biden, the Hunter Biden laptop that you've got journalists who are aligned with Democrats. And therefore, it makes sense that they all would sort of collectively come together to suppress that story. What's interesting about the 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 COVID origins is that you can understand why people inside government would want to suppress that. But for the media, it just to me, just sort of seems like groupthink, right? It's like if Fauci says something, they can't they've said that you shouldn't disagree. So then they can't disagree. And they all agree with each other that you can't disagree with Fauci. And so you get this kind of pathetic, I, I mean, does does that does that follow from what you're saying? Yeah, I mean, look, uh, inside Beltway, Washington Press Corps, insular, homogenous group thing is just a basic, undeniable reality of where we are in America in the present age. And, you know, I'm not entirely sure when exactly it got this this bad. I mean, you know, as recently as the Clinton administration, maybe even the Bush administration, maybe the Bush administration's went and into Obama's when starts to kind of really change there. Maybe the Obama presidency is when you really start to see kind of this firm, unambiguous kind of homogenous group think of like 95 percent registered Democrats being sitting there and, you know, to 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 field questions to the White House press secretary. But at this point, it is just undeniable that the overwhelming majority, you know, uh, my my longtime friend Eric Erickson, the radio host, refers to uh, the Washington press for time and time and again as the quote unquote circle of jerks, because. 
it is a circle. I mean, I mean, is literally yeah. kind of if you draw the line, it's kind of what you're saying. I, I mean, they are all kind of on the same page, on the same circumference. They are arriving, as the case may be, at the same conclusions. And, you know, we've now seen this revolving door over and over again where someone exits the White House press secretary role the next day. They're at some MSNBC cable news talking head role. They, the two way street is just impossible to deny. And it's it's really irksome. Um, unfortunately, I don't have a particularly good solution to do about it. One thing that, you know, as someone who has worked in the media for a number of years that I have been saying now is one of my big things is I just want people to be honest about their predilections and their beliefs. If it, it, You know, this whole illusion that, you know, a New York Times A1 front page reporter can just do straight news when it comes to kind of the Hunter Biden laptop story. It's probably a misnomer in and of itself. And, you know, Trent, you're a, you're a student of the American founding. I mean, at the time of, of, of the American founding, you know, there were pro-Federalist Party, pro-Hamilton yeah. newspapers. There were pro-Democratic Republican, pro-Jefferson newspapers. No one was really trying to hide the ball that much. So in the back of my mind, I kind of wonder, wasn't that model probably a little better than what we have now? I'm not sure, but I think so. Certainly seems more more honest. The second question kind of builds out of that one area where maybe we see a breakdown in some of that group think is around whether Joe Biden should be the Democrats 2024 nominee. Uh, you know, you've got, you've got his team and, and Biden himself out there suggesting that uh, this is, there's no issue and uh, he should, you know, he obviously he's going to run for reelection. You certainly see some discontent in the press. Where do you think that's going to go? So I think a lot of elites in liberal circles clearly do not want Joe Biden to run. I mean, I, I wrote a couple of recent columns on this. One, I was just kind of pointing out that it seems literally that on the same day, you have some elite outlets like CNN, Politico, New York Times, that are dropping basically the same story. There's been a series of stories recently. Joe Biden's age, is he too old? Age is catching up to the commander in chief. Oh, we've never had a commander in chief who is this old. You know, things like that. And there's been any number of stories trying to throw Kamala Harris under the bus, too. I mean, her staff has had infamously high turnover, and that turnover has yielded a a, a really absurdly high leak rate as far as kind of the ex-employees who are speaking either openly or discreetly to the press about how horrific a boss she is. So you add that up to what happened about a month and a half ago uh, in the middle of January with the Biden document retention scandal and kind of the the, the the Penn Biden Center there in, in D.C. and Delaware and the fact that all of this is coming to the surface. And my read on that, which is not just my read, but I think it was a lot of people's read, is that there probably are some you know, deep state actors, we might say, kind of deep in, deep in the FBI or DOJ who are just now kind of releasing this information. They're leaking it. Why? Well, maybe, maybe they don't want Joe Biden to run again. The problem is that I think Joe Biden wants to run again. And assuming that he does, I, I, find, I find it very hard to believe that a primary challenger, if he or she were to even try to challenge the incumbent would be able to dethrone him. Uh, maybe I'm wrong, but I, at this point, I predict Joe Biden is going to run. And it seems to me that the, uh, the only reason that his formal announcement has been somewhat delayed is they're probably trying to find some way to at least kind of test the possibility, kind of put lift their finger, put in the wind as to whether it would be possible to kind of get Kamala Harris off the ticket because she is profoundly unpopular. But I I'm skeptical that they'll be successful in that either. So I think Democrats are probably stuck with Biden-Harris 2024. Wow. And, uh, you know, obviously here at Save Our States, we protect the Electoral College. And so we're very interested in states and uh, people moving around to different states. That's been an interest of yours because you actually did it. You moved to Florida like a lot of people have been doing. I wanted to ask you, Josh Hammer, about that. What has the experience been like moving to Florida, particularly ahead of the midterm elections, where Florida was the sort of sum total of the red wave that was expected everywhere else. Almost a sum total. You, you know, there were some other states that did well. So Iowa is actually one state that stands mm -hmm. out that actually did quite well. O Ohio, for the most part, did well as well. So there, there were a few other diamonds in the rough. But to your point, it is true that Florida, I, I think, did better than than basically any other state. Yeah. So I moved here uh, August 2021. One, I think was the was the exact one. So I moved here kind of smack in the middle of COVID. And I bounced around a number of states trends I've lived in at this point, seven, eight, uh, I think seven or eight states, something, something along those lines. I lived in Texas for four years. Uh, my concealed carry license is actually still Texas. So, I, I mean, I, I I have lived in red states before. I mean, Florida is not kind of my, my first go around. But what's ha happening here in Florida is 
it, it's kind of hard to describe unless you're unless you're here on the ground then you feel it. It, it it just feels very special there's any number of kind of right-wing events i mean i frankly like my, my social calendar just being like a little more personal i go to more kind of right of center leaning events, not just socially, but professionally, educational lectures, you know, all that stuff. I, I do more of that than I ever have living anywhere else, you know, even even in the Northeast when I when I lived in DC. So there's a ton of just of, of just intellectual ferment and energy here. And obviously you can't ignore, you know, the elephant in the room, which is Governor DeSantis and what he has been able to do here. And um, you know, he really has overseen the transformation of the nation's third largest state. From an iconic purple state. I mean, it wasn't that long ago, the 2000 presidential election, the hanging chads. I mean, you know, forget the 2000 election and the 2018 election when DeSantis beat Andrew Gillum by about 30,000 votes, 0.4 percent. I, I, I mean, you know, Rick Scott, I think recently won by, I think, 1.2 percent in, in 2018 as well, if I'm not mistaken. So. This has become a red state, and there was not a single Democrat in um, in statewide elected office for the first time since Reconstruction. Republicans have super majorities in, in both legislatures, so it's going to be very interesting to see what they can do this legislative session. But uh, you know, you know, Governor DeSantis and Senator Rubio actually, so really all the top line Republicans from this past midterm election. You know, they carried Miami-Dade County, which is the nation's most populous county, seventy percent Latino. And a lot of people think, you know, they look at that and they say, oh, it's just the Cubans coming back. Well, it's actually really not just the Cubans. The Venezuelan vote is now kind of firmly right of center. You know, Governor DeSantis and Senator Rubio, they also won Osceola County, which is outside Orlando in the middle of Florida, which is actually predominantly Puerto Rican County. So this is not a Cuban phenomenon. Just, you know, this Florida is kind of showing, I think, the future of what this kind of working class kind of, you know, multiracial realignment can look like. And the COVID stuff has a lot to do with it, but so does just the fight against the woke ideology. I mean, in education, the governor has made education a huge, huge issue for him, combating CRT, gender ideology, all of that. So it's a very exciting time to be here. I, I've become somewhat of a Florida booster. So um, it's uh, it's just really fun to be here right now, honestly. Yeah, very impressive. And, and Osceola County is where a lot of Disney employees live, right? Is that, I've, I've heard that, that sort of ordinary people who work at Disney tend to live in Osceola County. DeSantis took on Disney. People were saying, oh, he's going to, you know, Disney people are are, are going to, uh, you know, turn against him. And the opposite <laughs> seems to be the case, at least for the ordinary kind of people who, who work at Disney World. So uh, interesting to me. Question number four, the flip side of that is, you know, people are somewhat sorting out red states seem to be getting redder blue states seem to be getting bluer you know there seems to be fewer purple states out there you know one response to that is that just happens from time to time in american politics the other response though is that something different is going on and you have people talking about national divorce and secession and you know really what most you know what by typical political standards would be very extreme uh conversations going on Josh, what do you what do you think about all that? Is is this just a cycle in American politics and we're going to swing back the other direction or should we be more concerned than that? Yeah, the national divorce stuff yeah, is is somewhat troubling to me. I mean, I, I have some friends who arrived at that conclusion in very good faith. I mean, folks like Jesse Kelly, um, the Houston based radio show host, who's a, who's a very good personal friend and has been for many years now. So, you know, I have people all across the spectrum, so to speak, on this particular issue. Look, Trent, from my perspective, there are four possible paths forward when we talk about kind of national divorce. There, The first path, I, I mean, I, I, in, in, so in no particular order, um, one is just the status quo, whatever the status quo is, which is kind of this slowly deteriorating sense of not belonging. And we all kind of hate each other. Not a, not a particularly palatable option. The second option that I see is is radical federalism, like an actual kind of rediscovery of James Madison and Federalist 45. The you know the, the the powers in the federal government are few and defined. The powers reserved for the states are numerous and indefinite. You know, uh, maybe that might even entail a possibly kind of rethinking so-called incorporation doctrine of the Bill of Rights. If I want to get really edgy, um, you know, my friend Professor Elon Worman at Arizona State Law School is working on a long piece of scholarship right now, trying to bring that kind of older legal argument about the 14th Amendment back to the forefront. So, you know, that, that, that would be like a real way to kind of like, like legitimately kind of get federalism going again. Um, the third option. So the, so we have um, uh, what do we say? We say we say national divorce, radical federalism. The uh, Sorry. So national divorce, radical federalism, the status quo. And then the fourth option 
which is probably my preferred option, but I think it's a long shot, is kind of a Lincolnian kind of restoration at a national level around a substantive vision of the common good. Um, now, I'm born on Lincoln's birthday. I'm a Lincoln guy. I'm a you know Claremont alum. I mean, uh, I love the, the common good stuff. So that is my preferred option. However, for, it's hard to see that coming. I have no idea who that who that Lincolnian leader would be right now. So I think my preferred option, frankly, is radical federalism, um, at least as kind of a short to midterm South. But I think the national divorce conversation is uh, I think the most the best way to say it is it's a little it's a little premature. Now, I am open to the idea that at some point in time, that might be the only path forward. But we're talking here about a real last resort option. I mean, this is not something that I think should be discussed you know, unless and until like really all other options have been distinguished. So uh, I, I am open to being convinced of it at some point later in my life, but that is not my stance as of right now. Yeah, I, I, I agree with that completely. I think uh, I think in some ways it's sort of like the people in, in the 90s who were saying, you know, if if, uh, you know, if the national debt increases, you know, a little bit more, you know, within the next few years, we're going to be in Zimbabwe or something. People people get the time scales wrong on a lot of these problems, I think, which makes you know, there's a tendency to see things as being, despite, you know, despite problems being real and, and substantive and potentially even existential, you know, people sort of compress the time, the time scale down to make it something that has to, you know, we've got to figure out next year or something like that. I think that's, it seems to me part of the mistake that's driving the national divorce conversation. Uh, we, we've seen the left tearing down statues, taking names off buildings. I mean, this real attack on American history seems to have slowed down a little bit now, though. And I, you know, your governor, Governor DeSantis, took on the uh, AP uh, African-American history class. And actually, the, the the AP curriculum folks backed down and made some changes to it, which is remar remarkable to me. I mean, do you see things starting to swing back uh, in, in the right direction from that moment of, you know, really, uh, uh, you know, really intense, uh, destructive activity on the left directed at American history and institutions? Or, you know, or do you think we're just in some kind of a, a pause because people are more interested in, in other topics at the moment? It's a very interesting question. I mean, I guess I see both sides of the uh, both sides of the argument. So, you know, Black Lives Matter in particular has not gone any a, anywhere. And, you know, they're only kind of buttressed when, you know, horrible tragedies like the recent, um, you know, incident with uh, uh, the Memphis Police Department are, are kind of brought to, to the surface. So, you know, I'm not sure that kind of post George Floyd kind of, uh, you, you know, racial conversation, for lack of a better term, has has extinguished. But you're correct to flag the, the DeSantis versus the versus the college board example when it can, when it comes to the AP African American Studies course. So the college board has 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 pushed back on this narrative. They have said, "Oh, we didn't make any changes due to the governor. These changes were already out there." I, hard to believe that. I mean, like the timeline from a very straightforward perspective, you know, looks like Florida took a very hard stand, and like within like a week, the college board basically folded. Mm -hmm. um, so it's very, I think it's very hard to take their word at face value. Now. Uh, the, the proof of this proposition will ultimately be in kind of the electoral pudding. So a lot of these kind of woke issues, so to speak, about kind of rewriting American history when it comes to Ibram X. Kendi, the Nicole Hannah-Jones 1619 Project. You want to talk about the transgender stuff. You want to talk about biological men and women's sports. Uh, this notion that, you know, that, that if you are a second grade white child uh, in, in public American schools, then you can be told that, like, you were the son of racist bigots, uh, secessionists, homophobes, whatever. Uh, I, that sentiment is definitely a minority proposition. And and the polling consistently reflects that, which is why, you know, I, I feel like I've been screaming someone into a void for years, at least until politicians like DeSantis have helped to kind of normalize it to to run on these issues, you know, to make this fight against this woke ideology kind of the centerpiece of your political platform. And, you know, there are some signs within the Republican Party fold that, you know, folks besides Florida are starting to get it. So so Jim Banks, the congressman from um, from Indiana, who I think is, is is gearing up to run for Senate next cycle, he he has talked. Uh, he he wrote a piece for Claremont Institute's American Mind Journal talking about his anti woke caucus within within the House GOP. You know, query exactly what the caucus will do to, to day to day, but it's the right idea. I mean, kind of rallying around. I think anti wokeism is a is a very good move for the Republican Party. In fact, Ben Weingarten, uh, my friend, who's also a Newsweek 
opinion columnist, he had a great he had a great recent column focusing on the Jim Banks example and arguing that anti wokeism should be the glue that holds kind of all the varying warring parts of the Republican Party together. So I think that there is something there. The proof obviously is going to ultimately be in the pudding. I have to say, I, I, I am kind of loving this recent internist Nessine fight at the New York Times when it comes to the transgender issue. You're kind of seeing, you know, folks even, you know, it, within one of the most woke captured institutions in America trying to kind of duke it out as, as far as kind of how partisan, how hardline they can get without sacrificing journalistic integrity when it comes to kind of the, the transgender surgeries or whatnot there. But the final thing I'll add here is that this is interestingly when it comes to that final issue, the transgender surgery, which in my mind is is kind of like the is the quintessential kind of woke fight. This is actually one issue where Europe is considerably better for the most part than than the U.S. is, yeah. which is which is very interesting. Sweden has been actually very, very good on the on this issue. The U.K. actually, which is typically not good on many of these issues, they have taken a, mu a much harder line as as far as kind of so-called transgender surgeries for, for for the U.S. So, you know, historically speaking, over the last century or so, the the American left has tended to try to emulate Europe. So, you know, perhaps that emulation will continue. Yeah, yeah. When you're when you're to the left of Sweden, you've got you've right. got to wonder what has has gone wrong. Uh, you know, I that uh, uh, yeah, the, the examples, especially from Europe, I think uh, I, I think even people on the American left have have realized that in some ways they've gone too far. But because of that groupthink that we were talking about in the first couple of questions it's a little hard for them to figure out how to unravel that. As you, you mentioned, the New York times question number six of our six questions for Josh hammer, the opinion editor of newsweek. Last time you were on, you said your favorite founding father was Alexander Hamilton. Uh, definitely one of my favorites as well. The question is about Hamilton. He seems to have received a lot less backlash than some of the other founders do you think that's because just because he he didn't own slaves, although there, there's at least one historian out there who claims that he did. Do you think it's because of the musical, because he just was was less, uh, you know, has been less known in the latter part of the 20th century and the early 21st century? What What's going on there with with Hamilton kind of skating by as some of the other founders get so much ire from uh, from these folks on the left? Well, it's, a, it's an interesting question. Um, I, I obviously you know, can, can only guess here, but. I, I mean, Hamilton was a New Yorker, right? He, I mean, I mean, he, his rise to political prominence was was in New York, so that kind of you know right off the bat kind of separates him from those kind of nasty Virginians like Madison, Jefferson, George Washington, folks like that who lived in you know in a in a colony turned state turned kind of uh, you know bastion of the Confederacy. So, I, I, I mean, that strikes me as one obvious differential, and and then kind of the difference between kind of owning slaves definitely plays a big role in this. Hamilton was also, you know, you know, he was he he was he was born, you know, out, outside the U.S. He was quite literally an immigrant, uh, you know, before that term even meant anything. There's actually some debate in Jewish circles as to whether Hamilton might have had, uh, or whether he himself possibly even even was Jewish. The, the the consensus is probably not, but 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 he he definitely had some Jewish ancestry. I think he went to, uh, even to like a Jewish school, if I'm not mistaken, at least for a few years. I could be wrong about that. Um, so 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 you know, like his. I don't want to say his intersectional credentials, because uh, if anything, being Jewish actually cuts against you these days in intersectional circles. But but but, you know, if you combine kind of the immigrants with kind of the Jewish background, with not owning slaves, you know, a picture starts to emerge that is just a bit different or at least or at least a little uh, less prone to being uh, lambasted in bad faith or mischaracterized like, you know, like old Thomas Jefferson there in Monticello in, in Charlottesville. So it's just like a slightly different. And, you know, he also Hamilton, uh, unlike Jefferson, did not, you know, pen the Declaration of Independence, which has this this rhetoric that is contrary to owning slaves. So it's less easy to kind of say that he's a hypocrite. Um, uh, so th those strike me as kind of the most obvious reasons for this. Uh, one other possible answer, like you said, is is the musical. I mean, the popular musical has just I I've, I saw it twice in person. I, I actually enjoyed it. I know a lot of conservatives did not enjoy it. I I, I definitely enjoy. It. I had my bones oh, yeah. to pick, but I but I thought it was a wonderful production, honestly. So uh, yeah. I think I think it's probably had a role to play here as well. Yeah, no, I I love the musical, and and I love the fact that in you know I think your 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 answer the discussion just kind of gets to the. I mean, Hamilton is a he he doesn't have those 
those obvious red flags that the left has, you know, that, that in some ways are legitimate, but in, in other ways, the left sort of created in order to pigeonhole various figures in American history and say, we can't listen to him because of this. We can't listen to him because of that. Yeah, Hamilton doesn't have those, which makes him a great way to talk about the founding and the founders with people who, you know, maybe have spent too much time, you know, in, in public schools or, <laughs> or, or elsewhere. Uh, and uh, yeah, no, I, I love the, uh, I, I love the, the musical. I think, uh, uh, yeah, I, I think it's unfortunate that some, some conservatives, I think just because folks on the left accepted it, I think some, some of our fellow conservatives have been kind of resistant to it, but, uh, Josh remind people how they can stay in touch with your really outstanding writing. And I mean, your, your journalism is something that every educated American should follow. So how do they do that? Well, that's very kind of you, Trent. So I run the Newsweek op-ed section day to day. So that's newsweek.com slash opinion. I write a weekly syndicated column, which goes up in Newsweek and also a bunch of other uh, publications, prominently right of center. I mean, publications like uh, Epic Times, Daily Caller, Daily Signal, American Greatness, Town Hall, uh, The New York Sun, and so forth. I also host my own podcast, which is a Newsweek podcast. You can find that on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, uh, I, I think other places as well. But you know, those, those are the two main spots. It's called yeah. The Josh Hammer Show, so easy enough to find. But this has been a lot of fun, Trent. Thanks so much for having me again. Yeah, thank you so much for being on. Thank Thanks to all of you for listening and watching. Thanks for being a part of what we do at Save Our States to defend the Electoral College, defend the integrity of our presidential elections. Until next time, I'm Trent England.